I am continuing to tell dramatic tales of healing and mystical experiences from the biography of Harry Burnett Rhodes. The playlist is in the notes below. Harry Burnett Rhodes started as a healer in 1911, which was before things such as Reiki were known. Each chapter reveals more about her reality, where she tells about her life as if she were just having a conversation with you, and she talks about her lifelong learning, about how this mystical power works, and also advice for others. She has taught a few individuals how to access this healing current, as she calls it, and how to do the best with what life throws at you. And when it throws weird, just roll with it too. Previous chapters cover topics such as just because they're dead does not mean that they're interesting, where she gives firsthand advice on what to do with pesky contacts from the unseen worlds. And also she offers deep insights on what humans are capable of, if they can learn to quiet their minds, ask for what they want, and believe that they have a say in the circumstances of their own lives, along with sharing some wisdom from those spirits who served as her teachers and her guides. This chapter takes us closer to her day-to-day -day adventures in her later years of healing, of being called to the right place just in the nick of time to avert death or disaster. And she is always amused at how people arrive to her for help as kind of a last resort sometimes. Even back then, this was considered kind of weird. And how she interacts with them just as they are and in her own subtle ways makes it easy for them to accept that impossible things can and do happen. Each of her vignettes ends with her equivalent of, once they were healed, they were healed, at least for that malady. And with her matter of healing, even the chronic problems were cleared up permanently in most cases. And also it is rare to see how conscientiously this unassuming woman worked with people as they were to help them get on with their lives. This was never about working miracles only helping others when they asked. Chapter eight, Adventures and Cases. In 1928, I moved to Chicago. My children were grown and had professions of their own. Moving was far easier than it once was. Previous to that time, I had gone to Chicago occasionally to treat someone who sent for me. So I developed many interesting friendships that led to unexpected trips. I recall one occasion when the teachers kept telling me I should go to California. They said I need to go there to do a piece of writing. They were very specific about this trip, including a description of the house where I was to live and the room in which I was to work. My friends and I were amused and interested because everything they said was laid out in such detail, except they never got around to mentioning just how I was supposed to get to California. My teachers were always dependable, yet I had no conscious expectation of actually going to California. That said, there was no doubt that deep in my mind, I was making preparation. On one of my trips to St. Paul, Minnesota for treatments, the California trip finally opened up. The husband of my patient overheard his wife's remarks to me about her forthcoming trip west. This was a man who never had seemed the least bit interested in my work. And he looked up from his paper and he said, if you ever go to California, I hope you will let me know. I should like to send you. It would be a small thank you for the immeasurable help that you have given to my family. I was astounded and thanked him, but I did not take the offer seriously. But later I found out how earnestly he meant his words and the trip became a reality. Upon arrival, I visited friends and found a house that was previously described by my teachers. It was just across the street from my friends. The workroom was there, and even the trees were exactly as I had noted down that they would be. And I did the work that I was told to do. My work in Chicago went on as usual. There were always as many patients as I could care for and as many responsibilities as I could carry. One day, my friend Ida Marshall told me something surprising. You are going to move back to Minneapolis and live in an apartment building on Lake Harriet. Ida was psychically gifted. I said in effect, well, that's interesting because I had no intention of moving back to Minneapolis. Soon afterwards, pressing calls came to me from Minneapolis 
And at Easter time in 1933, back I went. Even then, I did not look for a place on Lake Harriet. This is a little bit south of Minneapolis. Such a thing seemed futile. But of course, it was on Lake Harriet that I found my apartment. I went to the door as instructed. A woman looked me over and she smiled. She had no idea of renting her apartment. But then in the next breath, she was urging me to come on in and take the apartment. I have lived here for 18 years. The apartment is not large. It is three rooms and a bath. But it has been ample for a great deal of living. For the past 15 years, my sister Bertha has lived with me much of the time. Sometimes I think of moving, but when the time is right, I shall be made aware of it. Events have to ripen just as characters ripen. There is a moment when the apple falls from the stem and to wrench it off green is to do violence to its nature. Rather than pushing to accomplish something, if we listen inwardly, we are told when the time comes to make the change. Now, this is no doctrine of idle waiting. We have to fulfill the needs of our daily lives while at the same time maintain the state of inner expectancy. I explained this in chapter seven. It is a disciplined yet open state of mind. These later days of healing are no different from the days when the power first came through me, except now I know a great many people who've been helped. Almost daily, I meet someone that was once a patient of mine. Recently, I met a woman who had come regularly for a few months for about, it was about six years ago. She had a large lump in her breast, which caused her continual pain. Under my treatment, the lump simply disappeared. When recently I inquired, she said, oh, I'd forgotten about it. I've not felt it since then. Not long ago, I met a girl who had been in an asylum for the insane at St. Peter's. My friend Mabel Falstrom and I had been called to treat her. Back then, she was delirious and extremely violent. We could not leave her alone even for a minute. Given the chance, she would throw herself under the bed or try to even jump out the window. After a couple hours of treatment, she became quiet and later was taken to Mankato to her mother's home. When I recently encountered her, this same woman was quite well and quite herself and was about to be married. Sometimes I can help a patient even when he or she is too far away for me to see in person. One day in 1948, Mr. Brown was acutely ill, unable to attend his work at the post office. His sister, who is a patient of mine, called me long distance. I remember long distance was a big deal back then. And she asked me to try and help him from a distance. Could I do it from my home? So that's what I did. After several treatments, he returned to work. Another time, this same man was caught in a heavy rainstorm, which led to a severe cold. And he was confined to his bed with a sharp cough and a high fever. The doctor went to his house and diagnosed the illness as pneumonia. The doctor said that he would return later that evening to take Mr. Brown to the hospital. But the moment the doctor left, his wife telephoned me, begging me to help again, this time again from a distance. She did not tell me the doctor's diagnosis, but the instant impression that I had was of pneumonia, and I went to work. Later in the evening, Mrs. Brown telephoned again to tell me what had happened when the doctor arrived to transport her husband to the hospital. The doctor was completely mystified. Mr. Brown had no fever and his lungs were clear. The doctor believed that pneumonia would only heal after a lengthy time with the administration of drugs. Pneumonia could not just disappear like that. But Mr. Brown has been well ever since. That same winter, Mrs. Edison had come to me for treatments for her two small children. Later, her husband developed a case of rheumatism. It was so bad that he had to start working only part-time. One morning, he was suffering greatly and declared that he was going to drive over to my house for treatment. The problem was that there was a massive snowstorm blowing outside. This was Minnesota in the winter, and his family felt such a trip would be extremely foolish in this kind of weather. It didn't matter. Mr. Edison was in the mood to be healed, so he came anyway. 
He said miserably that he had had enough of his sickness, enough pain, enough limitation, and he wanted it no more and none of that foolishness. So I treated him with my whole heart. Then I did not see him again for months. When I eventually ran into him, he said that the rheumatism never bothered him again after that day. She has so many stories. There are really too many to include here. So I'm just including some of the highlights. Mrs. Hornick had but one bout with pneumonia and was confined to the hospital for some days. A short time afterward, she had a relapse. During the time that she was waiting for her doctor to start his treatments, she called me to come over to see her. I treated her for two hours, and by the time the doctor got there, she felt pretty well. And in a few days, she was completely back to being herself. Later, her husband, Mr. Hornick, spilled a wash boiler of hot suds all over his feet, so bad that they were badly burned. Yet we forget the inherent difficulties that could happen back in the days before washing machines. Sheets and clothes were often put in a big tub on the stove to boil in the water that had to be lugged around. So back to the story, a doctor told him that this would incapacitate him for quite a while. When his wife wanted to call me, he objected loudly. He had no intention of being treated by a woman, but pain won out over his judgment and I was called and I gave him a long treatment and I could feel that the damaged tissue was being restored. When I left him, he put on his shoes. Needless to say, he was soon well. One day, my son Jim was driving me to St. Paul when I suddenly said, Jim, we must go see Mrs. Bach at once. And he said, why, mother, you don't go to her house until Tuesday. We must hurry, I insisted. So we covered those several miles as fast as we could. And as we neared the Bach home, we heard her screaming. The first thing I saw was the flesh hanging loosely from one arm. Immediately, as I placed my hand on her arms above the burns, the power became almost overwhelming. In about half an hour, all the pain had left. One of my guides helped me with the directions to dip soft claws in strong tea and wrap that around her arms lightly. But what had caused this dreadful injury? Mrs. Walter Bach was not familiar with the furnace at her new house. While she was doing the washing in her basement, she noticed that the steam gauge on the furnace was extremely high. Frightened and uncertain, she opened the furnace door and decided that throwing a pail of boiling hot soap suds on those white hot coals might cool it down. The explosion which followed threw ashes and steam all over her and burned her neck, face, and both arms so that they were covered with blisters. Her son heard her screams and was attempting first aid when we arrived so unexpectedly. Remember, we were not expected for several days. I treated her twice a week. Exactly three weeks from the day of the burn, I called my son Jim to come in to see her arms had healed. They were perfectly well and there wasn't a scar. The same is true for her face and her neck. She said she had slept every night without any distress. A friend of hers, who was a trained nurse, told us that those had been third-degree burns. The next story is about Mr. Clausen. He is a musician, very fleshy and very talkative. One Sunday, about five in the morning, I was called to his house to pray for him. He had come to the end of his endurance. The weather had been extremely hot for a week, and the doctor had said that Mr. Clausen had been suffering from a kidney stone. I was not aware that for some reason he was told not to drink any water. My first act upon arrival was to give him a glass of water. He raised his head and he said, lady, I now love you. He and his wife had thought that he was dying. A concerned neighbor telephoned me in desperation, hoping that I might pray for him. After the treatment, I had his young brother get a ripe watermelon and instructed Mr. Clausen to swallow all the juice that he wanted. An hour after the treatment, the kidney stone passed. The doctor finally arrived to transport Mr. Clausen to the hospital, only to find his patient outdoors tending the flower garden. Mr. Matson, 
who comes often to get or to give help, had been in poor health for several years. When I first met him, he was scarcely able to get about. He had become so extremely nervous that he could not sign his own name. After the treatments, he was entirely changed. He had relaxed inwardly and outwardly and took on a kind of a bloom. Moreover, he saw no reason why someone else should have to bring in the healing power for him. Why couldn't he be helping other people? He prayed, he emptied himself of himself and set an expectation to be used to heal others. And so he was used. He was used continually and does very fine work as a healer now. He described his own case in the simple phrase, from darkness to light. This is not the only one of my patients who has come to be healed and then gone on to develop a healing power. Anyone can make mistakes, and sometimes excellent physicians make them. I recall Mr. Monroe, who first came to me nearly 30 years ago and was cured of mysterious stomach trouble. About four years ago, he had a return of the gastritis, and his family called a physician. The diagnosis was severe heart trouble. That meant no more walking upstairs, no more mowing the lawn, nor any other kind of strenuous exercise. He was instructed to lie in bed for 10 days to relax and rest. The instant the physician left, Mr. Monroe sent his son to get me. I told him his trouble was gas pressing against the diaphragm that was causing this palpitation of his heart. You know, I, I don't diagnose in technical terms. And this is for the best of reasons. I don't know the technical terms. And when I do pick up a few, I see no reason to hazard using them. The healing power works for any difficulty and large words do not help things heal any faster. To be sure, scientific terms have their place and scientific healing has its place. And when I need to, I will turn to medical aid. I am a physical being and so are my patients and everyone who heals is a servant of God. Anyway, back to the story. Mr. Monroe had plain old gas pressing on his heart. The treatment relieved the gas and it also relieved his mind. He got up that day. I gave him a series of treatments and after that he was well. He built his own garage and then found a good job at which he's still working now. Mrs. John Nelson fell on the sidewalk and dislocated her hip. Friends wanted to call a doctor and an ambulance, but she insisted on being carried to the nearby dress shop and then having her son come and get me. As soon as I saw her, I beheld clairvoyantly that her hip joint was out of place. After I had treated her for a few moments, she gasped, what are you doing to me? My bones are moving. I used no pressure. I just laid my hands on her hip. For a week, I treated her daily, and she walked around the house to attend to her duties. Then her husband came home from a trip, and he called the doctor, who promptly ordered her to the hospital to get some x-rays. The doctor said, I don't believe your hip was ever dislocated because no one could ever put it back in its place and you would have been in a fracture bed for three months and then on crutches for six months after that. So this is just impossible. Then the x-ray showed that there had in fact been a fracture. He said, I still don't believe it. Finally, a third x-ray convinced him. The picture shows a definite fracture, but it is perfectly healed. Those x-rays now hang in the corridor of that hospital. So the cases go on and on. Each day brings its need and its deep satisfaction. Harry makes a point that she has at times had her own health issues. I want to focus on how she deals with these setbacks. As you may recall from the early chapters, she had many health issues as a child, incessant headaches, difficulties with her eyes and problems with stamina and dizziness. As an adult, her thyroid grew to a condition called a goiter. But other than that, her other problems all seem to have gone away. She comments that a goiter remained with me long after it became inactive, but it is now being absorbed and my health grows better and better with the years. 
with a more serious ailment at one time, friends such as Mabel Falstrom and others that she had taught healing work would come and work on her. She was always optimistic. That is something highly consistent in her story, taking whatever life offered as an opportunity to learn, to grow, or change. She states her teachers explained what felt like illness was actually her body shifting, rebuilding, or changing to make her more fit for her future work. An example is, on July 29th in 1948, I saw an oval flame of light with a dark blue background. In the center was a small light which grew to be a large white flower. I saw a priest in a gray robe with a pointed hood, and he said, this little light that grew into a flower is a symbol of the unfoldment for which you are ready. The cells of your earthly body are being filled with energy from higher planes to which you are attuned. There is a vital energy in food which must be chosen aright so that there will be no darkness in the cells of the body or inner vehicles. Rejoice with great gladness that you are now upon the earth. Look always upwards. The earthly illusions will drop behind and trouble you no more. Okay, so this is Harry talking again. Later, an Eastern teacher appeared to me and said, much depends on proper eating, no meat. From that time, I have only rarely touched meat and only occasionally when refraining from eating it would embarrass my hostess. Certainly my troubles have indeed dropped behind. Some patients come for a time and leave in fine health and then return again. What doctor does not have a longing to make people so well that they stay well? Certainly not everyone is completely cured either. One woman had a serious intestinal condition so bad that the Mayo Clinic told her husband that she could not live very long. That was many years ago. She has been coming to me about once a week ever since. When she skips a few treatments, the distress returns and she looks ghastly. When she comes regularly, she appears to stay in good health. I feel with her, as with so many others, that if she had the faith and could make the effort spiritually, she could learn to tap into this power herself and would not need to return to me. Probably everyone could learn to become his own healing channel, but it takes a lot of spiritual gumption. Fundamentally, one has to offer his life to God's use and determine to be a channel for expressing his love in all ways to all persons. I do not believe that lack of faith in a healing power holds people back so much as not wanting to give up certain selfish acts and attitudes. They sense that prayer for healing and power will put a burden on their character. And this is true. And so this can prevent full healing. This is the end of most of chapter eight. See the next video for short but important advice from Harry Vernette Rhodes for those who might want to try this for themselves.